seminar series. Today we are having a seminar with a speaker from Ukraine, Dr. Vyacheslav Vimut. He is a researcher at the Kretsky State and Law Institute of the National Academy of Science of Ukraine and a lawyer at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. He graduated with honors from Law Faculty of the Van King Court of Lviv National University, Master's Program of the University of Connecticut School of Law, PhD Program of the Kretsky Institute of State and Law of the National Academy of Science of Ukraine. Dr. Bikun researches primarily in the areas of philosophy of law, European human rights law, constitutional law, and comparative law. He is also the author of more than 500 publications in such genres as scholarly articles, translation, journalistic <coughs> investigations, and interviews. The topic of his talk today is Human Rights in Cinema, a guide in search of justice and inspiration. Welcome, Mr. Swan. Just uh, one organizational thing. Uh, after the presentation, the floor is open as usual for questions uh, regarding the presentation and questions in the field of human rights that you are interested in. And at 8 o'clock, you are also welcome to join the activity on the third floor. Thank you again, and thank you everyone who made it possible for me to be here today. And thank you individually for coming here. I hope that you will enjoy it and find this inspirational for your work and for your studies. So the topic of my presentation is Human Rights in Cinema, a guide in search of justice and inspiration. Here's, let me give you a concept of my presentation. So we will do a short introduction and then we will look into the human rights film history and modernity. Then look at the human rights form and content. Human rights philosophy and cinema. I'll try to present some topics in human rights cinema in terms of philosophy of law. Categories. You will see shortly how it might look. And then you will see also in, in the brochure in particular there is a filmography that you can explore yourself if you're interested in this law. But philosophy approach, philosophical approach to human rights in cinema, that might be a um, topic of men in power, let's say dissidents and political prisoners as victims of human rights violations, freedom as a human rights foundation freedom, slavery, lawlessness, and inequality, and so forth. Then we can touch upon the topic of human rights violations in terms of crimes against humanity. Um, we will look into a particular category as law as a statutory law and law as a right. In German, if you know German, in German literature, you know the difference between Recht and Gesetz. That will be more clear when we look into that. Justice and human rights, and the topic of globalization of human rights, something that you're probably particularly interested in. Then we also touch upon the topic of legal protection of human rights. You will be able to see how international institutions, one of them in which I work, human rights courts work and are reflected in cinema. And then uh, you will see in the brochure some films on topics like rights of life and is it a is a right to death, a right to die. And much, much more interesting for you as we are personalities, we might look into the inspiring role of these personalities and human rights activities. You can choose your own film, and maybe you can make your own film. So let's do an introduction first by asking ourselves what are human rights? Who can give you? Who can give me an example of a definition of human rights? And if you look for such a definition, where we would, where we would, where we would like to look for it? So if I may suggest, we can look at some human rights documents, for example, that, right? Some human rights instruments, as we call them in legal terms. So I have a view, and probably some of you have already, the European Convention on Human Rights. So let's look into that convention for the definition of human rights. Are you have it? If you need in in French or in Spanish, let me know or in German. Let me know I have one. You need in Spanish or English? English? This is a convention, how it looks, how we in the court use it. Very convenient way to use it. Absolutely. So, as I mentioned,
function. Let's look for definition of human rights. Okay. 
to that. I'll, I'll, I should mention that, that it's a film about a man, young man, uh, who is in a relationship with a woman, and he had a relationship with four women before, and he explores his experiences with that by telling this experience in the movie. So, in this particular case, he meets one woman, he, he, he is very missing another woman, so after the missing was one, he's talking to you about his experience. It's one of my favorite songs. I can't say that every time. I can't say that. The movie is a terrific moment. And then, in the morning. You didn't have any food. I can help cool about, um, what's her name? Laura. Laura, right, right. Laura. What was yours called again? It was called James. 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 Do you miss him? Yeah. It's how it works, right? I think it's okay if you feel horny and fucked up at the same time. And why should we be denied our basic human rights just because we messed up our relationships? You think sex is a basic human right? Hell yeah! Yeah! <laughs> Uh, sorry, I, for, I forgot to tell that there might be some words are inappropriate for academic discussion. <laughs> but I hope you forgive me that. So, you see the context of a human rights discourse, you can say, and a popular problem. But let us look into the history and see whether there are human rights cinema or in cinema topics in the history. And I would say there is no human rights topic as such, uh, as a main plot of a particular film historically. But there are films that might be viewed as those that express this fundamental basic human rights. For example, in 1917, in Kiev, between Bershkov and made an interesting film about a Bailey's case. Bailey's was a Jewish who was charged with a, with a murder of, ritual murder of a young boy. Now, the film director believes that that was a fabrication of charges against him, and he showed that in the film. In 1928, a remarkable movie by Dreyer was made, which is called The Passion of Jeanne d'Arc. You will see some images for that film shortly. It uh, depicts a well-known story of Jeanne d'Arc and one and a half hour movie again, right? So a fair trial was raised there, you can say. Another remarkable movie, a German, uh, German film director, Prince Lang, made it, which is called M, which stands for murder is a film about a serial killer who is wanted on charges of allegedly killing many, many young ladies. And state is unable to catch him. So criminals, criminals themselves are in search for him and they finally catch him. Moreover, they put him on trial. Criminals try an ordinary citizen. But the citizen. So you might not feel pity for this man because of what he died, but then you might have sympathized with him, and moreover you sympathize with the topic as such. And the film ends with, with a question, who will take care, who will be responsible for our children? And that is our future, you can say. So a fundamental, interesting film that raises social issues that are important at that point of time in Germany, you can say. Certainly, human rights aspects of film were brought by what we call drama. Some might find it boring, some might find it interesting. These are real life stories. In case of legal uh, situation, these are trials. Now, these are the images of the film the Trial of Jeanne d'Arc. A passion, Jeanne d'Arc. Passion, it's a Christianity word, you understand. The Passion of the Christ, for example, the film also depicts a trial. Uh, of Christ. And you can see these images, the images you can say of the good and evil. The 
Well, we live in modernity, we like modernity. And if we discover that problematic, we we'll see much more. For example, in the database, international movie database, which has over 1,600,000 films, has, in equal C, more than 900 titles indexed by a keyword human rights. Now, if you compare that, for example, to another another uh, database, which could be, for example, database, a Russian database, which has plenty of movies, uh, Kinopoids, it's called, then you will see around 300 films. And the tendency is that there are more and more films indexed by that keyword. You would see this, for example, in 2011, that was 850, and 175. As to Kinopoise database. Now, if you look into genres, you will see that the documentary that dominates. I should also mention that there is a complex keyword, so to say, that, that means, for example, human rights abuse, sometimes, or so, children human rights, or human rights lawyer, and so forth. And I should also mention that there are many films, as I mentioned, for more than one million films. And many, many of them are not English. So I guess there is plenty of human cinema material that you can explore as a subject of study or research or inspiration. Now, it's no surprise that there is infrastructure developing around that. For example, Human Rights Film Network. Now, in this network, for example, there are more than 30 film, human rights film festivals that are specifically dedicated to human rights topics. You see the geography of this. Now, these are particular human rights film festivals that deal exclusively with human rights topics. Moreover, there are institutions, the many institutions interested in this, and you will find archives of documents and films like at the University of Washington or at the University of Connecticut where I graduated about human rights. <coughs> Moreover, human rights is a matter of social demand, that means people want to see that, and that is the case, for example, when there is an anniversary of certain international documents like Human Rights uh, Universal Declaration. Uh, in 2008, there was a film which is called Human Rights Stories, you see the image of the uh, DVD of this film uh, was made, which, which is a collection of various films made by prominent, you can say, um, film directors. So we can say there is intensive development on that. Now let's talk about content and form. Now of course we could talk about documentary and fiction, and we know that documentary dominates our fiction. And you can see that in the film, one of the best documentaries ever made, according to a ranking, which is called Night and Four, it's a French documentary about Nazi fascist camps during the Second World War. You see the image on that film. Now, you might note this definition. Photography is truth, and cinema is truth 24 times a second. Do you know who said that? Maybe you know from this uh, abbreviation. What do you do? Godard? Mm -hmm. Godard? A French film director? Godard. That was his definition. And uh, so no wonder that truthfulness is one of the core elements of definition of human rights films. As expected by people, for example. They have to be truthful. They have to do best of things. And uh, we can also probably explore a bit in case you will see many movies, you will be able to qualify them, to classify them. And this Dan Brockers uh, suggests the following definitions, the following classification, explanatory, denunciatory, search films, or documentaries, and testimonial. Now, they are self-explanatory, you can say. First, for example, explanatory is a situation, country, or 
team mixed or requested images from field interviews from the denunciatory films are both that denounce a particular human right violation, abuse, and make someone responsible for that as much as possible, search documentaries, investigate, leaving problems, however, unsolved, as so, for example, whereabouts of disappeared persons or background of political killer or the facts behind a political trial. In testimonial, not much attempt to explain, explain denounce, or there is a very little commentary, uh, personal, but there are personal details to illustrate the particular situation. Um, you can say that these are crisscrossing, so to say, classifications, but they might be helpful if you look into a particular number, a great number of films. Now, as we mentioned, documentary is more as truthful, there are more documentary about human rights violations, abuses, and so forth, but does it mean that fiction is disqualified? Now, if you know this name, Krzysztof Slewski, a Polish film director who made a film like Deco or Street Colors, a genius, I would say, a film director, he started as a documentalist, actually during the Polish uh, national movement against the Soviets, so to say. So he went into the courtroom and started shooting films during the trial. And then he, real then he realized that people adjust to that and uh, then he doesn't reflect reality, which is unfortunate. He changes reality. So as a film director, he believed that might not fit his purpose and he switched to fictions as he believed that fiction is a better way to express the intent of a film director. So we can be still true, truthful when you do fiction about human rights. Well, there is a new genre, you can say, which is called documentary. It's a mixture of documentary and fiction, and you can see it, for example, in a film like Punishment, 1971. Now, I see you taking notes, you don't have to do it, because in the brochure the list, there is a list of film and much of what I just said. So, you can take notes if you want, just not to forget what you really like, but not necessarily everything. And then there is amateur films, what I call this, something that you do on your own, as a non-professional, and there are, there are great instruments to help in that respect. There are organizations that even will give you a camera, so you can make a video. And then sometimes you can bring that video from your country into mainstream news, and make it a, a news event. You can be a newsmaker, or the video can be a newsmaker. There is an organization which is called, for example, Witness, that does it in our sports of this verb, so to say. Now, let's explore some topics about human rights films, and we will watch some films finally, some episodes. But let's look before that into so the human rights philosophy in cinema. And uh, in looking for uh, that, we would uh, like to have answers to the questions. Like, why legal order implies a respect for human rights? Why should we respect human rights? And scholarly, this issue includes three elements, which will be a description, what that is, a spectrum manner, which is an analytical task, clarification of the status of human rights, and justification of human rights, which is normative normal task. And I would argue that film provides at least possible Resolution to two tasks, description and probably clarification. Might be a justification, right? The human rights film is an, is an instrument. Now, if you look into a topic like men and power, you remember Mark Nowitzki was saying this is about human rights. Now, you will explore films like about legal dissidents or uh, films about human rights, freedom as human rights, about foundation or about slavery. You will find the list of those films in the, in the brochure. And uh, you will see that uh, that is one of the most important, most widely presented topic in human rights uh, context. But I will not explore that, probably you've seen some of that. But let me touch upon another interesting topic, which is about law as right, correct in German. And he says, uh, which is statutory, we can translate it in English. That is to say, human rights, 
contracts on statutory law is a, is a law which was made by states. They might conflict. To understand the conflict that possible between these two concepts, we might then look into distinguishments between superstatutory law and natural law. And when we look at one of the terms you might have seen, which is called judgments at Norbert, you might see the difference. While we do it, you will think about how do you bring to the charges guilty or not guilty? Naked surety. Remember to Ernst Janning. Ernst Janning, are you represented by counsel before this tribunal? Ernst Janning, are you represented by counsel before this tribunal? Ich vertrete den neuen Tag, wo es für dich. I represent the defendant, Your Honor. How do you plead to the charges and specifications set forth in the indictment against you, guilty or not guilty? Wo es für dich darf ich im Namen des Angeklagten eine Erklärung abgeben? Your Honor, may I address the court? Der Angeklagte erkennt die Autorität des Gerichtes nicht an, und wünscht formellen Protest einzulegen. The defendant does not recognize the authority of this tribunal and wishes to lodge a formal protest in lieu of pleading. A plea of not guilty will be entered. Constitution will begin its opening address. The case is unusual in that the defendants are charged with crimes committed in the name of the law. These men, together with their deceased or fugitive colleagues, are the embodiment of what passed for justice during the Third Reich. The defendants served as judges during the period of the Third Reich. Therefore, you, Your Honors, as judges on the bench, will be sitting in judgment of judges in the dock. And this is as it should be. For only a judge knows how much more a court is than a courtroom. It is a process and a spirit. It is the house of law. The defendants knew this too. They knew courtrooms well. They sat in their black robes and they distorted, they perverted, they destroyed justice and law in Germany. The prosecution will please watch the light. The interpreter cannot follow you. I'm sorry, Your Honor. They distorted, they perverted, they destroyed justice and law in Germany. Now this in itself is undoubtedly a great crime. But the prosecution is not calling the defendants to account for violating constitutional guarantees or withholding due process of law. The prosecution is calling them to account for murder, brutalities, torture, atrocities. They share with all the leaders of the Third Reich responsibility for the most malignant, the most calculated, the most devastating crimes in the history of all mankind. And they are perhaps more guilty than some of the others. For they had attained maturity long before Hitler's rise to power. Their minds weren't warped at an early age by Nazi teachings. They embraced the ideologies of the Third Reich as educated adults when they, most of all, should have valued justice. Up here, they'll 
receive the justice they deny us. They will be judged according to the evidence presented in this court. The prosecution has nothing more. Chair Rowe will make the opening statement for the defense.
even if they just carry out their law as they are required by their own country. And that is because this carrying out may be a violation of human rights. Rights. Not necessarily statutory legislation. Now, this is a my my might say the universal problem. And, uh, one might say this is a huge problem of violations. Let me present you another excursion into this topic, and uh, that arose uh, and is called as a Milgram experiment. In the 60s, after Adolf Eichmann trial, you might, you might know this name. Adolf Eichmann was one in the high ranking of a German Nazi government who was responsible for anti-Jewish politics. And he was caught after the war and tried in Israel. After this trial, an American scholar wanted to inquire into a question. Was it the only Eichmann's problem and those who follow that? Or is it a universal human problem there? And in order to answer that question, they made a, what is called a Milgram experiment. Now, let us look into this documentary about this experiment. I'll just briefly tell you about how it was done, because we will not see the whole experiment. So, um, people who belonged to this experiment didn't know what it was about, and they were presented with the following situation. Now, they would be participating in experiments about learning, how people learn. And there is a theory that people learn better when they are punished. So, you learn something, and if you don't know it, if you haven't learned by heart, for example, you will be punished. And that will encourage you to learn better. And the way punishment would be here to give you a more voltage, ACDC, so to say. And the more you don't know, the better voltage, the more voltage you will get, electricity shock, so to say. So there are people in this experiment divided into two groups. One is the one that is punishing, and the one, the other is the one that learns. Now, as we go through this experiment, and people don't answer the questions, we will see that electricity voltage is rising. And people are raised very important questions like, why should I do that? What does he feel there? Why does he shout, why, why does he shout there? And so forth. So you will notice that it's not about how you learn, it's about something else. So let's see a part of this experiment documented and this documentary. Mm -hmm. This film deals with the issue of human trafficking and contains... Fifty percent of the subjects obey the experiment's commands fully in the experiment depicted in this film. Wrong. Wrong. False. One thirty-five. And it's a woman. And white cloud, horse, rock, house. Answer wrong. Hundred fifty volts. Answer horse. It's I'm 
safety by hope. Fine. I can't give the kind of 
judgment that you wish to force upon us. I beg to be excused from sitting upon this court martial. Why, we do not deal with justice here, but with the law. Was not the one who conceived to serve the other? Why? Can't you see that you must first strip off the uniform you wear and then your flesh before you can escape the case at issue here? Decide you must, Wyatt, or else reason with us. Show us how to save the boy without setting aside our function. Do you think that Seymour and Radcliffe here and I wouldn't save the boy if we could find a way consistent with our duty? Well, perhaps you can do this. Can you do it? Speak, man. Speak. Show us how. Save him, Wyatt, and you'll save us all. Particularly, I mentioned that 
Of course, we, we, we disrespect, we don't like this situation, but when we look into why it happened, why this honor killings happened, then we see also reasons why this might happen, why it might be justified. Also, we in this society, in Western society, we don't agree with that. And we can see issues like criticism of old, ancient law, outdated law, in terms of human rights and universality. And there are several films on stonings in Iran, for example. One of them is a stoning Syria in Jerusalem. Now, there might be a film about human trafficking in touch on the place if we have time. And continue with globalization. And that is a film that might you might work already about, and that is a film which is called Terra Ferma. It's an Italian film which is nominated for Oscar this year. And uh, an interesting film that brings several issues. Uh, the first issue is about how we, as those who live here, treat those who come to us, problem of us and others. And the second is more interesting for lawyers, is about the conflict between the law of the land, which is in this case means do not cooperate, do not help illegal migrants, conflicts with the law of the sea, which means help, you are obliged to help people <coughs> an open sea. So now these issues are brought in the light of uh, family and Sicily. A simple family of fishermen who are dealing with their own problems, they are trying to survive by serving tourists, and at the same time they get into this situation when uh, illegal migrants, they help them, but they have to bury their own personal consequences for this act. So let us watch how it might look. It's a fact that it's in the zone. Grazie. No. No, grazie. Mi capisci quello che dico? Cocco. Tu adesso riposare, mangiare e poi andare. D'accordo? Mangiare. Sì, mangiare. E poi andare. No, io ho un sogno pratico di legge. Ah, non è pratico? No. 
Ma bisogna che cominci a pratichirsi. La licenza per portare i turisti a mare, me la fa vedere per favore? Non ce l'ho. La parte è sotto sequestra. Ma dice vero o stai scherzando? Dico vero. Ma non è la volta che ci lavagliamo. Non avete il permesso per portare i turisti a mare. E in più avete commesso un reato ancora più grave. Favoreggiamento all'immigrazione clandestina. È un codice romano, o canosci. Anche i cristiani la via a fare morire in forno. Quale cose sono cambiate? Lo dica anche ai suoi colleghi. Fino a tanto che la si si lava, le consegne le chiavi. Allora, allora il mio modo è proprio problematico. Le consegne le chiavi. Ragazzi, si fa un po' e state dite dove? Ragazzi, un mio da fare. Questo chi è? No, lei chi è? Dai, dimmi, stai calmo, eh? Stai calmo, guarda che la non è per me. Non si vuole venire a vista, guarda. Passa, guarda. Dimmi, guarda. Passa, guarda. Guarda, 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 human being can be mad, 
can be crazy, psychopathic, then the same could be true of a corporation. So they look at these factors, at incorporation and establish whether they are corporation or psychopathic. Burning the Future, Call in America, an uh, interesting documentary about how people are influenced, the life of people in a particular state in the United States because of the developing of coal. Now this, I saw this movie at the festival in Kiev. Uh, the director was also there, Novak, David Novak. So we could see in this film how people, in particular water, is contaminated and people are getting sick. They're getting, they're dying because of that. And how much effort it takes just to get the clean water at this time in America. And what an achievement is that for them? Again, it's about cooperation, it's about responsibility. Crude, the real price of oil, it's an amazing documentary. You might want to see also, it's in another country, about the same topic about oil. And then we see Mark Label. Let me bring your attention to this film. It's a film that more than 20 million people have seen. And this film will all also bring us to an institution I thought uh, to represent that will be the court in Strasbourg. Now, as you can see from the topic, it's about uh, probably a famous company you might know. So let's see in two parts. This film, the first is the beginning of the story in Britain, and then the end of the story at the European Court of the United States Council.
We've beaten McDonald's. Now it's the UK government's turn. Dame Helen now taking um, the case of the European Court of Human Rights, which is the most important court um, in the whole of Europe, um, and will seek to argue that UK law um, is in breach of European Convention of Human Rights, so the stakes could not be higher. The European Court is going to have to consider a number of fundamental issues about English libel law. The first is the obvious unfairness of the system that uh, allows one party to have huge amounts of resources and lawyers um, and the other have none without any legal aid. It's only um, for libel suits that you can't get legal aid. In every other um, kind of legal case, um, the legal aid is there to achieve the balance that's required for justice. The significance of the McLaughlin trial is really about you know this worldwide movement now to oppose entrenched corporate power and corporate wrongdoing. There's no one person responsible, but there's no question that when Helen said no, it really fueled the fire. I'm not going to bet you money that McDonald's will vanish tomorrow, or that we will suddenly you know, transform our society into a compassionate and caring and humane one tomorrow. But when I was born, there was segregation in the South and black people couldn't ride the same buses or, you know, sit at the same tables with white people. And Nelson Mandela was in prison when I was a kid. And so things absolutely can change. Okay, so we know you don't like corporations, but um, what's the alternative? The alternative is basically taking control of our own lives, our own communities, our own workplaces, and making all the decisions that affect our lives and, and affect the environment. You know, deciding what happens to the resources, deciding what work needs to be done. People say, oh, it could never work, you know. You just have people going around and doing murdering and stealing and things like that. But that's what happens in this society now. You know, you've got corporations and, and wealthy individuals that own vast swathes of the planet and deny other people access to them. And it's, it's basically stolen from everybody else. Well, obviously, there's always going to be problems in any kind of, you know, group of people or society or whatever. But you want to remove all the unnecessary problems. Uh, for example, poverty in the midst of plenty, or some people have 50 houses and other people don't have a home to live in. Most so-called kind of antisocial behaviour is, is actually people fighting over the crumbs that are thrown from the table. The real people who are behaving antisocially are those that control all the resources and deprive other people of what should be shared amongst us all. If we remove corporations and governments who care only about profits and power and, you know, take things into our own hands. Obviously that's basically transforming society, that's a revolution. Uh, but not just on a single day, over a period of years, building up uh, strong grassroots movements until one day we can take over all the decision making ourselves and look after our planet. On the 7th of September 2004, European hearing this morning. Kind of ironic that we finally got legal aid, so now we've got a whole legal team with us. Keir has to do all the talking. We're not even allowed to speak. This is Clarissa Wright, my assistant solicitor. This is Keir Starmer, our wonderful PC. And this is Anthony Patterson, our junior barrister. And this is Mark Stevens, our solicitor. I've, I've put in all the additional bits yeah, we discussed yeah. last night. Sure. I've cut out, in order to make it 30 minutes, the only the bits I've had to cut out are Professor Nicholson yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in its entirety. Or right. even the meaning. No, no, no. no. The, the, the I'm not dealing with over script um, thing. Yeah. I don't think I'm much. Let's right. start with that direct and comment and all that. That, that one that was repeated six times. I never understood that anyway. <laughs> so we'll leave that out. 
it's long been recognised that it would be wrong for central and local government to be able to sue for libel because it restricts free speech. And we're questioning before the European Court whether that rule should be extended to multinationals. They often have more power and wealth than small countries around the world. They can get their message across through the television, through other media, and through advertising. Um, and they don't need to go to court through ancient non-fair libel proceedings. So, oh, no, don't ask me. Oh, that was great. I thought the government was on the totally on the defensive, certainly on the on the lack of legal aid, which they now recognise should be available in defamation cases in exceptional circumstances. The government referred to um, that uh, protection of freedom of speech should require that campaigners um, should put the balance in their leaflet and put the response of McDonald's, for example. Well, there's no requirement on McDonald's to put the balance in their adverts and say, well, actually, our food is healthy. Um, you really probably better not eat it. The campaigners are the balance, and we will continue to campaign until there's a just world. <laughs> February 2005, European Court verdict arrives today. Hopefully this is the very last day of the McLeaver legal battle. No court hearing though, just notified by email. Bit of an anti-climax after 15 years. Hi there. <laughs> this is such a welcome. This oh, is a... <laughs> great to see you. We're just trying to prepare two press releases. So we can get it out as quickly as possible, rather than write it from scratch. We've got one in case that you know we're losing all points, and another one in case we're victorious. Controversy. Oh, I forgot that. You have controversy. Let's find out. We might as well find out now. It's nine thirty. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. No, we're just checking it right now. Um, so, um, well, it might be. Hang on a second. One. What was that? No, it's a spam actually. Yeah, yeah, no. How can we get so much spam in one second? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Who are these spammers? 25 to 10, they haven't sent it yet. Well, which makes it 32 actually. We've found out the court. I think that might be a little bit That's impatient. Right. Stop. No. Internet is coming in. Don't shut that! Yeah. Don't shut it! I'm going to phone the court, it's ridiculous. See if they sent it. Can you give the number? Just don't. Um, they're probably trying to sort it out and you making any of the phone calls is not going to help. Uh, no, you're saying there's a technical problem. Okay, go on. Here we go. Here we go. For someone who doesn't care about the European Court verdict, he's extremely excited. I'm not excited. I'm going to get it over with, for God's sake. Actually, I've got an extension. We can... We can um, it's yeah. here. Okay. Yeah. Good, good, good. Da -da -da. It'll take half an hour to down. <laughs> European Court of Human Rights, press release issued by the Registrar. The, United Court, the European you? Court of Human Rights has today notified in writing a judgment in the case of Steel and Rice versus the United Kingdom. The court held unanimously that there had been a violation of Article 6, right to a fair hearing of the European Convention on Human Rights, and that there had been a violation of Article 10, freedom of expression of the Convention. <laughs> So it is, I think it might be interesting. It was interesting for me to see when you draft decisions how people receive it. So interesting <laughs> for me also to see. It. Um, then let us continue with some few topics. The next one would be a topic of Legal human rights protection. Now, for those of you lawyers, it would be interesting. Uh, to look into some what I call cinematic indictment of a state judicial system. We've seen something like this before, and one of the movies I would refer to is in, in the name of the father, John Sher Jim, Jim Sheridan film. Maybe you have seen it. One of the best British films I've ever seen, or Presunto or Bubble. 
Uh, it's about a Mexican legal system in which a man was charged with a murder he is believed never committed and how he has to struggle over the years to get out of the jail. Italian film and prison awaiting trial. The tenuto in the test of the test of the judice. Um, uh, Alberto Sordi film, uh, which is an interesting film you might want to watch. And the film was influential in the Italian legal system in many respects. So now let's look at the institutions and you can, you can see uh, about that in the film, like about the United Nations and the following mentioned film, about the international tribunals, about the international criminal tribunal and the following films. And you um, might certainly have heard and seen um, something about the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, and in particular about the Milosevic case. Now that was a controversial case, I'm sure you all know, and we have some bad time left. Let's uh, uh, see the episode about his authority, talking about Milosevic once he died. After a five years of the case, we became very, very close friends. It was something like my father. To be honest. But finally he died. Yes. Just a few hours after the hearing itself. 
There are two documentaries, many at least, that I know of, and they're also here. Probably, if they are, although they are not very long, I think we, we might skip it, so because they are well, also, if you're interested, this is it. You can watch it on your own. Let's see, it's a the bonds are five seconds, five minutes. Are you going to watch it? So it gives you a brief overview of the history of the courts. The old building, the new building, the judges. Никто не должен подвергаться ни пыткам, ни бесчеловечному. Contre les massacres et les injustices dont trop d'êtres humains ont été victimes. That was Rene Cassin. Maybe you have heard this name. And he was a prominent man who was a legal advisor to Charles de Gaulle and during the war. And after the war, he became an actor in this conventional activities. Then also became a justice of the courts. And at the end of his life, or about the end of his life, he received the Nobel Prize. And for that money, he established an institute, the Nekaset Institute in Strasbourg. And there is an excellent, excellent course that he had summer that you might want to attend. Now, I was asked, now we go to questions, what are the most common issues or rights that are infrequently dealt by the court? Now, I prepared an answer for you, and that is before you. And you can see, and this is from a search system, the database of the courts, that the most commonly referred to right or complaint of is Article 6 right. So you see, Article 6, Paragraph 1. This is a number of cases or judgments and decisions in which this right was referenced. Uh, if you're interested to, in exploring that, you can do it on your own. If you go to the website of the court, this is it, the European Court of Human Rights, abbreviated COLE, which is Council of Europe International. And again, it's a very informative website. And then you see, you go to HUDOC, which is Human, uh, human Rights uh, Document Database. And then you go to particular human rights and database, and then you can see that you can find all the documents there about decisions and judgments. And in our case, for example, you can go by articles. So if you choose, I wish you choose also, let's say, decisions and judgments. Then you go by articles, and here you go. You have all the articles Article 1, Article 1, Paragraph 1. Protocol one, excuse me, and so forth, and then it's, it's a bit. It's in the process of being developed. They, we will have shortly a new database, which is more modern and uh, easy to use, more friendly. Uh, but this is Article six again. This is what we saw: Article six, Paragraph one, Article six, Protocol one, Paragraph one, and so forth. I see there was, I think, that there are more now <laughs> than it was before. So uh, this is the, uh, the answer to your question, I hope I'm brief. Now, I was also asked, uh, uh, can, we, can we specify that particular in the present situation? This is a statistic, a recent statistic from the court. Now, there are 152,200 1, cases pending before the court. The end of January. Now, this is how they look in terms of particular states. So you see, Russia is number one, which is about 26 percent and a bit more, which is more than 37 states altogether. Other states. 
just to compare, and then we have Turkey or Italy, Romania, Ukraine, and so forth. Now let's specify on that and let's look at Ukraine, for example. You know probably there are more than 10,000 cases against Ukraine pending, and that would be 33% of those. Concern Article 6. Article 6, but in respect of the length of proceedings, about 15%. Right to an effective remedy, Article 13. 11%, and you probably know that Article 16 comes along with Article 6. <coughs> Other rights, 18% and property. Protection of property. Paragraph, proto, paragraph 1, Protocol 1. Or Article 1, Protocol 1. Article 1, Protocol 1 to the Convention is about 23%. It's a growing number. Comparatively to Italy, let's say, you see the difference? Length of proceeding cases 53%. The right to a fair trial would be less, otherwise much less. And protection of property is something again that will be emerging as a right which is often complained of. Now, one more statistical aspect will give you a more idea of what's going on to this, what happens to these cases. For example, in Ukraine, you see that most of the cases are so-called single judge cases. That means they are attributed to a single judge as a formation to decide this case. That's the name, how the name says, a single judge. The judge himself will decide upon this case, whether it's admissible or not admissible. And there's a majority of cases. Then you see that there are cases that are pending governmental action. Usually these are after communication cases. So communication 4%. There are chamber and committee cases. These are formations in the courts. We don't have time to specify that, but that's how it looks. And I should also mention that most of the cases, which is 97% of applications that are submitted in respect of Ukraine are inadmissible. Inadmissible. So that means the absolute majority of cases are not admissible. Now, about justice. Can there be a right to a private justice if a state is not able to do justice through its judicial system? Does one have a right to a private justice? Now, the legal scholars argue about that, and but uh, cinema went far, far in that respect, and we can see plenty of interesting movies. I'm, I'm pretty sure you saw this one, led by Citizen. And finally, the aspiring role of personality, human rights activists, for example, Anna Politkovska. She was killed, you know, in uh, this killing is to be still investigated there are many many interesting different things about that Jean Dominique was a ATM journalist who studied in France and he was agronomist this is how the film is called and at the meeting he was opposed to the dictatorship he instituted a journalist a, a, a radio station a very charismatic man now, there are state figures, public officials, Leonardo Roosevelt, Malcolm Little, which is known as Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Dalai Lama, there is an interesting film about him, Nelson Mandela, many folks, Andrei Sakharov, Vyacheslav Chernobyl, Václav Havel, who passed away recently. Uh, Awan San Su Pyu. She's a politician from Burma. There is a new film, The Lady is called, which is came out in France, made by the new person. So, uh, and finally, the lawyers. Uh, 
Now, there are not many films about lawyers, probably because this is their job to do, and uh, not many follow them, but the rest of them, like about Paris Darrow, for example, who was viewed as the best American lawyer of the 20th century. And there was an excellent film to kill a walking dog. You probably know that, so you've seen that movie, and this is that we will conclude. And there are other movies that are inspirational, like Trials of Daryl Hunt. It's an amazing documentary about a black guy who had to go through 20 years in prison and fight in legal battles in order to prove that he is innocent. And there are other documentaries like Woman and Show that's about what lawyers do in Iran, for example, to go against the stone as a punishment. Now you can choose your own film from the filmography that you have. You can make your own film. Just to conclude, uh, let me show you what is might be met, meant by respect to a lawyer or anybody who does his job very nicely, probably. Um, That is an episode from the film To Kill a Mockingbird. And that is an episode after Edwin Sorin delivered his speech, his, uh, his arguments, and he leaves a quote from it. I'm just looking for it. Questions? We, uh, so I think uh, <laughs> it was a good presentation. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Right, so.